All right, so I will now jump on to our genicular neurotomy section. Um, I'm sure many of you have experience with the genicular nerves. When I was a fellow back in 2011, the article in Pain published by Choi was my first inroads into this world. Um, at that time, radiofrequency ablation was really uh, focusing on the medial branches of the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine. Although there was some work on major joints such as the hips, the knees prior to this, really I feel that this 2011 article from Choi plus the uh, introduction of cooled radiofrequency ablation for pain management uh, really started to, to take this off. And over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of great discussion about what are the best targets for the genicular nerves. What I'm gonna show you here today is the fluoroscopic classic technique. Um, I'll try to describe some of the discussion that's going on over the last year as far as what might be better genicular targets and help ensure that you, you have the, the safest way going forward. So a couple key things here. Um, positioning is so important. Everything we do uh, it is particularly important for this particular procedure. Uh, one of the common tendencies for uh, patients is to externally rotate their legs as they lie down uh, supine on the OR table. So one of the things I, I really strongly encourage you to do is, is tape with some internal rotation of the femur so that you can actually have the joint basically fully AP. Uh, what Justin has done here is he's put the patella right in the midline of the femur and tibia, and you can see the tibial plateau is fairly uh, level, as you can see here. Now our target points uh, historically and classically have been three points. Uh, there are two superior points right at the junction of the condyle to the shaft. Um, and, and basically, we, we just draw our two dots there. And then on the inframedial aspect of the tibia, that really captures the infrapatellar branch of the saphenous, um, which is also a common arthroscopic port site insertion, which a number of patients may present to you with. There is no fourth infralateral target uh, because that would capture the uh, superficial peroneal nerve, uh, which is a mixed motor and sensory. And again, the key here is that we're only addressing the sensory afferent nerves. We certainly do not want to impact the efferent motor nerves because obviously we don't want to cause any motor dysfunction or problems with ambulation. So to get started here, um, I will start to radiographically mark out my target points. And it's okay to be a little bit off the os here. So there's my one. And I'll just come around here. And there's my second. And my inframedial. I'll go a little bit further. I'll go a little further out. Perfect. All right. So some, some key things here with the cooled radio frequency procedure, um, and a little history here um, from Bayless to Halyard to Avenos, you know, they really brought this technology to the pain management space. Uh, this technology has been used in cardiology for uh, radio frequency ablation for atrial fibrillation. Uh, it has been used in cancer oncology care for ablation of tumors, and now we're using it to create a moderate and modest amount of damage to the nerves so that we can block nociception. However, it does not cause exonomesis. It does not cause permanent neural injury where you might end up with a deafferentation. So the advantage to cooled RF over standard RF are a couple things. Number one, you get a larger volume lesion. So you get a nice spheroid lesion as Glenn showed you um, with the previous presentation. But secondly, you also get distal projection of the lesion. So in your standard RF lesion, it's basically from the tip back to the uninsulated portion. So whatever that active tip might be, uh, it just depends on what you choose. But with cooled RF, you get distal projection. That's very important for a number of the type of procedures we do, whether it is for medial branches of the spine or for other sources. So when it comes to major joints, whether that's the knee, the hip, the shoulder, the sacroiliac joints, having this larger lesion is advantageous because you're gonna have so much branching and spread of those nerves. All right, so to get started here, we're just gonna start placing our needles. And I certainly like the system because it has these pigtails to allow you to inject through so you don't have to like take things in and out. Um, so I'll just put all three in and then we'll make the adjustments here. Um, you don't need to be right on the bone. You can be a little bit off because, again, you're creating that nice spherical lesion. 
And so everything looks pretty good here. I might advance just a little bit, but that's it. And we'll go to a lateral. Uh, and I'll bring that to a little bit more inferior position. So you can see we propped up this left knee here with uh, a little radial loosened pillow. And that's nice because on the lateral, you want to make sure you're looking at your target knee and not both knees because you're going to be confused. The other key thing here is to line up the epicondyles. So you're going to see Justin and I talk a little bit about making sure those condyles are lined up perfectly. And he's already kind of eyeing it up. Go ahead and take a shot, Justin. Perfect. So you can do a little wig wag here. He's going to do the move or I can do the move. Perfect. We're getting there closer. And so this is what we're looking at. I don't know if we have a shot of me pointing at the screen here, but basically what he's trying to do is uh, create an eclipse of these two condyles here right of, this, of the femur. So he's doing a little wigwag here to bring that in. Um, our obliquity is perfect because you can see the distal aspect of the femur is fairly in line, but we can do a little bit more wigwag, Justin, to get those lined up. So we need these to cross over a little bit better. Keep going. They might be separating a little bit here. So we need the condyles to line up a little bit better there. You might need to do some more significant wagging or wigging. Maybe the other direction here. Keep going. Why don't I move our patient here uh, rather than Let's try a shot there. Uh, yeah, because he's got a pre. Okay. That's making it a little bit worse here. Let's try that. So we've got that. And let's try a little oblique as well. And let's do a little oblique. Yeah, let's see if we can... And then what I will do is, are you able to over-rotate with the C-arm, or if not? No. So let us, I guess I need to internally rotate a little bit more. Shot there. And we can't tilt the table, or can we? All right, perfect. So we'll get this. We'll just get the correct oblique. I guess we have to come up, bump up the other way. Perfect. Yep, let's try that. There we go. Perfect. We got that all lined up, and then we can do the wag to get those condyles lined up a little bit better so that we have it perfectly overlapping. And we'll go the other way. So this is super important. Um, again, you know, seeing the distal end of the femur uh, not perfectly aligned is not as important as seeing the condyle. So this is really what we want to see because that's going to really help us understand how far across the tibial and femoral shaft we are. So you can see my tibial placement here, a little bit too distal, I'm gonna pull back a little bit. And then Justin, if you don't mind coming back, take a shot there and then we'll go up to the femur. Perfect, if you can get all three needles in, that would be ideal. Okay. And I'm just gonna make some adjustments there. Okay, perfect. So. I'll pull back the tibial just a little bit further. You don't necessarily need to go right at 50% here because one of the key things here with this technology is when you place the probe in, it's gonna back up a little bit. So to be a little bit beyond 50%, more at the 55% or 60% is okay because you'll notice where the tip of the probe is. And one of the key things here too is sometimes you'll get this, little, this lean from the tubing here. And so you can stack some towels sometimes here to make sure that Everything looks good or rotate, and I'll just put a little bit of, yep, a shot there. So you can see it's backed up a little bit, and I'll just advance slightly, shot there. Okay, so that's that, you can see that radio opaque electrode is right at the 50% mark. I'll back it up just a wee bit, shot there. And so somewhere right in between those two points would be quite ideal for this particular uh, supralateral uh, position here. So 
you generally, or I generally use two probes if I have the chance, but otherwise you would do one probe for two minutes and 30 seconds, uh, and then you know, before lesion, start with some local anesthetic, usually 2% lidocaine that's carbonated, pull that out, and then do all three. Um, one of the other things you can do is a fourth needle, uh, and just if we come back around, we'll go to that AP again. Uh, this fourth needle is particularly useful. Dr. Caparol uh, figured out that some of the subvitellar fat pad nerves coming down the femur itself uh, need to be ablated in order to see relief. So this is one of the questions I often ask patients is if they have subvitellar pain, you should consider doing the fourth needle. Go ahead, Justin, go ahead and do your thing. Um, we, we changed the rotation of the patient, so everything's gonna be a little bit different. Uh, but nonetheless, what I'll do is I'll add the fourth needle. So basically all you have to do is go about five centimeters uh, cephalad to the patella, so you're outside of the joints, be right in between the two needles you placed, and then come in at a cephalad angle, and we'll take a shot there. Oh, you can maintain your uh, cranial caudal tilt and just head north towards the head. Perfect, and we'll take a shot there. And I want this to be right on the middle of the femoral shaft, as you can see there. So that looks quite good. Um, that's catching those nerves as they come underneath, traverse down the femur, and then branch up underneath the patella. So this is the fourth needle location. Uh, you can check lateral to ensure I'm os, but trust me, I'm on os because I can feel it quite easily. When we put the probe in, it'll sometimes back up a little bit, and that's okay, and that's good because we have distal projection of the lesion with cooled radiofrequency ablation. So this procedure is, uh, has level one evidence. Uh, Dr. Davis, to me, touchdown Davis, my good friend, did an intraarticular steroid versus cooled RF uh, comparison. And you can look at those um, tornado plots and see that about 80% of patients see at least a 50% reduction in their pain after cooled RFA. For intraarticular steroid injection, obviously not nearly good as results, but more importantly, about uh, just under 20% of those patients actually had worse pain after the intraarticular steroid injection, and nobody after cooled RF had worse pain. So kind of similar to what I was saying before uh, about another procedure, about four out of five patients are gonna see significant benefits. One out of five won't. Um, probably the most prodigious uh, type of patient are those after a total knee arthroplasty who continue to have pain, as you know, um, from the Spencer Liu articles, about 10 to 20%, depending on which articles you read of patients will develop chronic pain after their arthroplasty, but this can be used after arthroscopy. It can be used um, for AVN, uh, for uh, tumor disease, so osteosarcomas. Um, we've had some success with CRPS uh, and, and peripheral causalgias. So a lot of different indications. Um, you can also target very specific parts of the knee, so if the patient only has medial pain, you don't have to do all four needles. You can really focus on those two medial needles. Um, now with the 2020 uh, coding and reimbursement, there is one CPT code, 64624 for the knee. So it doesn't matter how many needles you put in, as long as you're doing the job and you're doing it right. You can also do this with ultrasound. Um, it's certainly something I was doing back in the day at UCSF. Um, but with fluoro, it's so quick and easy. You saw how, how fast, facile that was with fluoroscopy. But certainly if you you have ultrasound skills or a patient's pregnant or there's some reason why you want to use ultrasound, then by all means uh, do so. So Glenn, I, I think I'll wrap it up there. Um, uh, you know, in the future, I hope you guys will look into some of the techniques for the sacroiliac joint, the hip and the shoulder. The shoulder is the newest, latest and greatest. I really applaud uh, Avanos for developing the evidence, developing the techniques for major joint neurotomy. They're really leading the way and that's why they're a market leader when it comes to radiofrequency ablation. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask, and I am here for you. The question is, uh, can this patient get, can patients get this after a knee replacement? Absolutely. Uh, as I mentioned, that, that's the most common reason to do this. Um, you can absolutely do this for primary osteoarthritis as well. One of the conversations uh, I have frequently with the joint surgeons I work with, I'm in an orthopedic practice, is when to consider doing this. Do you do it before an arthroplasty? Do you do it after? And if you can identify a patient who might be at high risk for pain after their surgery, i.e. they have severe pain going into that surgery, they have significant opioid uh, use and tolerance, or any other psychological factors that might be playing a role in how they might respond afterwards, 
you could consider doing this procedure well in advance of the arthroplasty to help with post-operative pain management. So we've done that for a number of patients. One of the key things, though, to consider is that a number of our joint surgeons or joint friends are using bundled payment systems. And so there's a, there's a finite window in which you can do an intervention. So typically, we want to do it at least two weeks prior to the surgery. And then you need to wait 90 days at least after the surgery in order to consider intervening again so that you don't take away from their payment. Excellent. Is there certain conditions that you, you kind of just def, definitely stay away from? There really isn't. I mean, yeah. the only thing that I would consider uh, a contraindication is that if there's any concern about an infection. Yeah. Um, so there have been some complicated, you know, third, fourth revision patients who have really swollen knees. And there's a little bit of, you know, there's a little erythema, and you're going back and forth with the surgeon. You're saying, are you sure it's not infected? And they're like, we took cultures. It's not infected. We put them on antibiotics. And you're still a little bit unsure. Um, so if most of the time uh, after that conversation is set and you've documented that you're not concerned about infection, then I feel appropriate moving forward. Um, but besides that, there really isn't any contraindication. Um, thinking a little bit outside of the box, a little bit off label. Um, I've had patients with significant heterotopic ossification that really couldn't get much benefit from any other modalities, including medications. Cooled radio frequency ablation has been really helpful for those situations. It does require more work, does require more lesioning to try to get those nerves in different locations because the HO can be blocking your entry to those target sites. Uh, but it's certainly something for you to consider. Um, when I was at UCSF, uh, Dr. Wustrak used to send a number of those HO patients to me. Um, so something for you to think about. Excellent, excellent. And in, in your practice, I, I know you do a number of these for the knee. Just plain question, how well does it work for you? Yeah, so just like Dr. Davis's studies showed, I would say that 80% of patients see benefits. Um, Usually patients are getting at least two years of relief in my experience. Some will come back after six months or a year and say, you know, it's kind of wearing off. Um, but for the most part, the studies look at 12 month, 24 month outcomes and we're seeing really good outcomes. Um, what to expect, you know, since you, you asked the question about how, how long does the relief last, you know, what to expect after the procedure. I don't prescribe any pain medications. Usually I've used enough local anesthetic. Uh, patients tend to do well. I, I really enforce using ice, using over-the-counter acetaminophen or ibuprofen if they can take it, uh, and that usually does the trick. Every now and then, I'll get patients with a neuritis where they're really feeling it, um, and so very rarely do I need to prescribe anything stronger, but this is a really well-tolerated procedure. I've had patients who are wheelchair-bound after this, get up, walk, I mean, going back to the normal activities afterwards, so I've seen some pretty miraculous results. Um, but like I said, you're gonna see patients where you think they're gonna be a home run and sometimes it doesn't work out. So overall 80% um, and I think it's a relatively, I think a very safe procedure and something to be considered. Excellent, and I know that the Bayless uh, module has helped a lot of uh, patients in for SI joint pain, knee pain, hip pain, shoulder pain. So a lot of uh, clinical indications. Yeah, yeah, and that, you know, the, the latest with the shoulder is, is really amazing. It's been a neglected joint. It's been a challenging joint, as we know, because yeah. of the motor innervation. Um, but we know it's one of the most painful surgeries a patient can go through is a TSA or a rever reverse shoulder. So to have this as an option is really nice. Oh, it's excellent. And uh, quick question, to help answer a lot of questions for, just for RF. Yeah. What do you use for, uh, for neuritis? So I do, um, I mean, if I'm at the site, a little dose of dexamethasone goes a long way. If it's something that develops after the fact, um, then I can prescribe an oral steroid just to help them out there or reassure them with time that this will just get better. Um, I had a patient with a superior hypogastric plexus radiofrequency ablation who developed a neuritis and it just persisted for several days. So in that case, it was like the only time I prescribed an oral steroid pack to help them out. Um, and since then, for that patient who gets it repeated every 12 months or so for pelvic pain, I have injected a small dose of dexamethasone. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Naidu. Sure. Thank you.